I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine. Discuss a potential deal between Germany and Britain to continue supplying Ukraine with missiles, and we delve further into American politics ahead of a momentous year for the world with our guest, former Congressman Adam Kinzinger. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 25th of January. One year and 335 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, Berlin correspondent, James Rothwell, and our guest is senior political commentator for CNN and former congressman, Adam Kinzinger. I started by summarising the latest news from Ukraine. Ukraine has accused Russia of using prisoners of war as human shields. This comes as the United Nations Security Council met to discuss the downing of the transport plane earlier this week. Kristina Hayovshin, Ukraine's deputy ambassador to the UN, said that if it is confirmed that POWs were on board, the incident was, quote, the first case of Russia using a human shield in the air to cover the transportation of missiles for their further use against peaceful Ukrainian cities. She added... Ukraine was not informed about the number of vehicles, roads and means of transportation of the captives. This alone may constitute intentional actions by Russia to endanger the lives and safety of the prisoners. Dmitry Polyansky, Russia's deputy ambassador to the UN, told the Security Council that Ukraine made a, quote, premeditated decision to shoot the aircraft down with the aim of furthering Western geopolitical interests. The US said Russia was ultimately responsible because it chose to invade Ukraine. Just a quote now from Deputy Envoy Robert Wood, who said, Russia has repeatedly attempted to shift responsibility for the tragedies of this senseless war of choice as though it is the victim and not the aggressor. A couple more updates on this. Ukraine's GUR military intelligence agency has said that Russia rejects an international investigation into the downing of the transport plane. This comes from spokesman Andrei Yusov, who said, Concerning specific causes of the plane's crash, the request to create an international commission is logical and well-founded. At the moment, as we hear, Russia rejects the possibility of such a commission. Just a reminder, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov did say on Wednesday that an international investigation requested by Volodymyr Zelensky was, quote, absolutely needed. Let's move then and look at the front lines. The uh, the Institute for the Study of War, that's the ISW, have said that they believe Russia has given up on encircling Avdivka and is preparing to take the eastern Ukrainian town at a heavy cost by fighting through it. The ISW said the tempo of Russian attacks on the flanks of the town were, quote, far below previous levels, and it was instead trying to defeat Ukrainian troops by taking them on block by block. Russian forces may seek to replicate attritional light infantry frontal assaults to make tactical gains by brute force, as they did during the Battle of Bakhmut after breaching the city limits, said the ISW. So I think definitely the Battle of Avdivka is one to watch in the weeks and months to come. Um, Ukraine's uh, Major Maxim Morozov said on Thursday that Russia had amassed 40,000 men near the town in preparation for a major assault. Overnight, moving away from Avdivka, Russian missile attacks on two Ukrainian cities left seven people injured and damaged a nursery and a school. Alexandra Bukudin, military governor, of, military governor of Kherson, said two S-300 missiles fired at Kherson damaged the nursery and injured a 54-year-old woman in her own home. The military governor of Donetsk said six people were wounded, including two children, when Russia attacked Murnaharad, a small city northwest of Donetsk. An administrative building, apartment blocks, a school and 29 cars were also damaged in the missile attack. A couple more stories before we go to Francis. The Russian Black Sea oil terminal, which was attacked by Ukrainian drones in the early hours of Thursday, has been closed since the attack. This is the Tuapse oil refinery, which has halted its output after a fire started by the strike caused extensive damage. This, this comes from Reuters, who spoke to two industry sources. Just a reminder, the refinery is owned by Rosneft, Russia's largest oil producer, which has not commented. 
Finally, another interesting piece of information out from the ISW who say that the Kremlin has stopped handing out pardons to convicts who fight in Ukraine. You'll remember for, well, it started in last year, this idea that to replenish the loss of men in the Russian armed forces, the army and the various sort of military groups were touring prisons and offering people convicted of some heinous crimes the ability to wipe the slate clean if they fought in Ukraine. So uh, Russia ceased recruitment into its convict Storm Z units in August and started sending convicts into Storm V units. The contracts for service in the Storm V units are indefinite until the end of the war and do not include the promise of a pardon. Just one more quote from the ISW who said, The loss of convict recruits to attritional assaults in Ukraine and the relatively short terms of their service contracts may have prompted the Kremlin to enact more restrictive terms of service in order to retain more convict recruits at the front. Well, those are all the military updates. Let's go to Francis Sternley, who's been casting an eye on the political and diplomatic. Francis Sternley. Well, thank you, David. The most striking and commented upon news this morning is Putin's surprise visit to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, sandwiched between Lithuania and Poland. The city sits about 660 kilometres west from mainland Russia and is the only ice-free port of Russia on the Baltic Sea. Its population in 2020 is around 500,000, with up to 800,000 residents in the urban areas around it, if they're included. But it has an interesting history. It's a place, of course, we've discussed many times. And most significantly in the present context is seen as one of those flashpoints on the European continent. That 60-mile Swalki gap on the border connects Kaliningrad with Russia's ally Belarus, where course, Russian troops are stationed. For some analysts and commentators, this is the most likely place where any future war between NATO and Russia would start. As such, for some, his visit there is a clear statement of Russia's imperial ambitions. They say that he's taunting the Baltic nations, flying close to Estonia and hugging the coasts of Latvia and Lithuania in his flying Kremlin presidential plane. They say the timing is deliberate, coinciding with the enormous NATO exercise involving 90,000 soldiers. Another angle, which I haven't seen discussed, but which I think is also worthy of consideration, is that he's deliberately wanting to exaggerate the risk of some kind of future war, because it will mean Western countries are less likely to give weapons and support Ukraine and instead mobilise for their own protection. All of these, I would posit, are plausible, though I think it's also important to recognise, as Russia expert Mark Gagliotti has been keen to emphasise this morning, that it is more likely a sign of his renewed need to campaign domestically. Leningrad is, after all, a part of Russia. As Mark writes, and he'll be doing a special interview with us very soon, we shouldn't succumb to solipsism and assume every statement and action is meant for the West. March's presidential elections in Russia may not be in doubt, but Putin is under pressure, facing a restive public and a disaffected elite. Ever since the mutiny by Wagner mercenaries in June of last year, he's been back on the road, visiting regions across the country, trying to recapture his old status of the good Tsar. In other words, after so long being able to take power for granted, Putin is again having to work for it. Interestingly, in that context, Dmitry Peskov Kremlin spokesman, of course, said the visit wasn't intended to send a warning to NATO, but for the purpose of boosting development. And indeed, I think if they were being provocative, he would have probably articulated that, actually. They don't tend to shy away from probing. So lots of different perspectives. And the reaction is, I think, the most revealing, speaking to that increased anxiety as we begin 2024. What did Putin actually say and do in Kaliningrad. I think the most interesting thing is that whilst he was talking to students at the Kant Baltic Federal University, named after Immanuel Kant, who used to live in this territory when it was part of the German states, he hit out at Kaliningrad's neighbours for tearing down Soviet war memorials. He said this is stunning ignorance and lack of understanding of where they live, what they are doing and what will follow. And I'll talk in my final thoughts about the Kremlin's evolving views on history in light, or should I say dark, of the war in Ukraine. But in other news, Viktor Orban's charm offensive continues. It's been announced today that he will visit Kyiv for talks with Zelensky. So listeners will recall the Hungarian Prime Minister was invited back in December by Zelensky. And what 
comes as a surprise to many, Kiev now says it is organising the visit. It will be his first to Ukraine in 14 years, as hopes grow that he will drop his opposition to the new EU support for Kiev. As we reported yesterday, there is a lot of rumours swirling that he will drop that opposition. Also, as we discussed, evidently much work is being done more broadly within the EU and Europe to try and bring Hungary back on board. Following his dropping of the opposition to Sweden's accession this week, NATO head Jens Stoltenberg has this morning predicted that Sweden will be ready to join NATO by March. So he said, the message I've received from Budapest is that the parliament will reconvene at the end of February. I'm absolutely confident And I can count on Hungary. Now, that timing of the end of February, early March will, of course, be rather fortuitous for Kyiv, as it will come just after the two year anniversary of the full scale invasion and will mark of just how far Putin's project to split Europe and weaken NATO has failed compared to his initial justifications for the conflict. Now, in other news, you mentioned, David, the ISW's interesting research on it no longer handing out pardons to convicts. And just since we're talking about the law in Russia, I think it's important to mark the fact that today a Moscow court has once again extended the pretrial detention of the Wall Street Journal's Evan Guskovich until March 30th, meaning that he will be now in pretrial detention for over a year. And I know many listeners in the US and in the journalistic world care about this story, and they'll recall that he was arrested on March 29th last year on those espionage charges that carry up to 20 years in prison. He and his newspaper have, of course, vigorously denied the accusations. Stuart Wilson, today the American Consul General in Moscow, attended the hearing, which took place behind closed doors. Surprise, surprise, because authorities say details of the case are classified. Evan is the first foreign reporter to face the charges since the fall of the Soviet Union. Lastly... Bloomberg has conducted some interesting research. They've written a piece about how Russia has imported more than £790 million, about a billion dollars worth of Western-made microchips in 2023, despite sanctions against the imports. The chips, they claim, were imported by Russia through third-party countries, including China, Turkey and the UAE. It said its report was based on classified Russian customs data, which Moscow stopped publishing shortly after invading Ukraine in February 22. The West has levied, of course, those sanctions stopping Russia directly importing the microchips, which are used in drones and other military technologies. This doesn't come as a shock, but it does confirm what we already know in pretty stark detail. And just since we're on the subject of Western sanctions, some users in Russia on X, formerly known as Twitter, you know who you are, I won't name you here for security reasons, have done some noble work going around shopping centres to see what Western brands are still operating, despite saying they would stop. If you're interested in that subject, reach out to me on X slash Twitter, and I will share with you some relevant threads on this. We hope to look at it again in more detail in a future episode. Well, thank you very much, Francis, for all of that. James Rothwell, thank you so much for your time. It's really good to have you back on the podcast. Can we talk about your your incredible story, really? The headline, Britain in secret plans to send more storm shadows to Ukraine. But this involves Germany. James, tell us about your story. So this is a really interesting story. It's actually come out from Handelsblatt, a respected German newspaper over here. And it reports on a deal that is currently being looked at by the Scholz government. It was offered by the Brits on trying to get Taurus missiles from Germany to Britain. And then at that point, the Brits will reciprocate by sending storm shadows over to Ukraine. And this is being interpreted to some extent in the German media as a sort of creative solution to Chancellor Olaf Scholz's deep reluctance to be seen as directly providing missile support, as it were, to the Ukrainians. But of course, there's an obvious problem with this story, which is that this is not direct support at all. This is what the Germans call a ringtausch or a rotation, if you like. We've got some Taurus missiles going to the UK, which is all fine. But we're not seeing Taurus missiles going from the UK to Ukraine. We'll be seeing the storm shadows go up there instead. And so the fundamental request that the Ukrainians keep putting forward 
that they want those Taurus missiles is not going to be provided by this deal, if it's agreed, uh, and therefore it will probably fuel suspicion among many of Germany's allies that it's not doing enough to provide the Ukrainians with the military support that they so badly need. James, can I ask, what was the reaction to this story in Germany? What, how, how, how did the press react? What, what about the public um, reaction to it as well? Well, some in Germany think that this is a sort of creative solution. They, a couple of newspapers have noted that this is a bit of a fig leaf for Schultz. It allows him to indirectly give military support of some type to the Ukrainians, but without the direct provision of those Taurus missiles. As listeners will know, Chancellor Schultz for many months has been extremely nervous about the idea that Germany is perceived to be playing a direct role in this conflict rather than supporting it from the sidelines. But at the same time, a lot of Mr Schultz's critics, particularly in the CDU party in opposition, say that As I said earlier, the problem is that this doesn't address the fundamental request from Ukraine to get the Taurus missiles. And I think there might be a bit of a backlash on the way that people see uh, Mr. Schultz perhaps as tinkering around the edges of the problem. And this deal perhaps reflects that uh, rather than addressing the central issue, which is that they the Ukrainians really do want to see those Taurus missiles. And while more storm shadows are welcome, it's just not the same type of kit. Absolutely. Can I ask, James, in your reading of the German media at the moment, how prominent is the Ukraine war and how is it spoken about? I mean, is there much debate? We know, as you said, the German government has been accused of dragging its feet sometimes, coming up with creative solutions, thinking around the problem. But how how is that reflected in society, in your view? German media still has lots and lots of coverage dedicated to the war in Ukraine, particularly built newspaper. Uh, They've got lots of brave correspondents doing a lot of work there, certainly. However, one of the things that I've noticed in recent months is that the sort of focus of the coverage seems to have shifted from the actual battle activity on the ground and is looking more at the risk of a quite serious military escalation between Europe and NATO and Russia. So, for example, Boris Pistorius, the German defence minister recently, has warned that there could be an active military conflict with Russia in the next five to eight years. He doesn't think the risk is high now, but it could be risky in the future. That, of course, echoes warnings that we've also seen coming from Estonian and Norwegian and Swedish military chiefs on that front. And so the German conversation at the moment while still keeping an eye on the events in Ukraine themselves, does seem to be looking at the bigger picture now. And I do sense a lot of anxiety in Germany about the idea that not now necessarily, but perhaps in a few years, this may well escalate into a conflict which directly involves the Germans and NATO. James, thanks so much for your time today. Really interesting hearing your reflections on this story. I just wanted to ask, I mean, do you think this could conceivably work, the proposal being put forward by the British government? And what I'm really asking here, and I'm not going to make you a hostage to fortune, don't worry, is do you think the mood music in Berlin, where you are at the moment, is positive about this notion? Or do you think it's one of these things that is being discussed, but you just get that sense that there's too much hesitancy in the Bundestag to realistically see this as a possibility? That's a really interesting question. And it makes me think of a phrase from my Brexit reporting days, which is silence is the sound of deals being done. And this deal is not being done in silence. It's been briefed out to a very prominent German newspaper. I don't know whether the source of this story was the British side or the Germans. One could perhaps reasonably presume it was the German side because it's come from a German newspaper. And that does make you wonder if perhaps this is the Schultz government trying to run a flag up the pole in Germany to measure, as it were, the public response to this idea of providing those Taurus missiles or not. Is it actually going to happen? Difficult to say at this stage. I think we can reasonably assume uh, that Schultz would like it to happen. And as I said, he might be seeking some validation perhaps from the public to see whether the idea, having been briefed out to the papers, goes down well. There's actually a really interesting detail on this story, though, which is that according to Handelsblatt, the the newspaper that, that first published the story, the reason that Schultz likes this idea is that he will be sending these Taurus missiles with 500 kilometer ranges over to Britain. But the storm shadows going from Britain over to Ukraine 
according to Handelsblatt, would only have a range of about 250 kilometers. And that's because I understand they are an export variant of the Storm Shadow, which has got a, uh, a lesser range. That's really important in the context of Schultz's fear, if you like, about fueling the war and causing escalation. Because one of his big issues with the Taurus missile is that the range of 500 kilometers could mean potentially that the Ukrainians might use it to strike Moscow or that they might use it because it's a very powerful missile uh, to bring down the Kerch Bridge. Now, under the details of this proposal, that's not what would be going over to Ukraine. It would be a lesser range storm shadow, which perhaps couldn't be used uh, for that sort of attack. And that probably gets us closer to the heart of why the Schultz government does appear to be keen on this idea, because ultimately a less powerful, it seems, type of weaponry is indirectly going to Ukraine, thanks to the Germans. James, is there anything else uh, you think our listeners should understand about the mood in Germany, the news over the past few weeks, or your story? There's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things going on in Germany politically. I think something to keep an eye on is actually domestic politics in Germany, because the uh, coalition led by Chancellor Schultz has been in a lot of trouble uh, over the last few months. They had the budget crisis, which they've just about resolved by the skin of their teeth. They've got a migration crisis. They've got the AFD party, far right and much more sympathetic to Russia uh, than this government surging in the polls. There's not any speculation quite yet about the fall of the German government in its current form, but looking ahead to 2024, we've got some European elections, local elections here coming up, which might really bruise the mainstream parties, in particular Mr Schultz's party. Could that have an impact on the fall of a government, a new government, a government that's less supportive of Ukraine? Yes, I think that's quite possibly a scenario to think about in terms of the months to come. And so I recommend keeping an eye on Germany because, of course, they're such a, an important part of this story in the context of uh, support for Ukraine. Berlin correspondent James Rothwell, thank you so much for your time. Now, before we go to our guest, just a very quick update from me. Listeners will recall we recorded a special episode with guests at the UK Embassy in Washington in September, and we're delighted to say that the US Embassy in London has invited us to host a similar event here next month. More details, and how to apply for tickets, will be announced next week. It will be on the evening of the 15th of February. If you're not able to make it, we also intend to livestream it, with listeners able to submit questions while we broadcast. Please note, you'll need to be a subscriber to The Telegraph to attend and to join the live stream. Well, let's move then from domestic politics in Germany to domestic politics in the US. We've discussed Donald Trump this week following the results in Iowa and New Hampshire and its implications for Ukraine and American support. Well, Adam Kinzinger, former congressman, now senior political commentator for CNN and a keen listener we hear to this podcast, reached out to offer his perspective on this question. Adam, thank you so much for reaching out. Thank you so much for your time. Would you start just by giving us a, your you know, account of your career, your background? I think that'd be quite useful for our listeners. Yeah, so I hope, hello, everybody. It's great to actually be on. I listen every day. It's one of the best Ukraine updates ever. So thanks. And uh Look, I, I actually was one of those weird kids that liked politics when I was six years old and uh, can't explain it, embarrassed about it, but it worked out in the long run. And uh, when I was 20, I got elected to uh, the county board, so local government here in the States. And and then on 9-11, I, I joined the Air Force and made the decision to go fly. So I became a pilot in the Air Force. And in fact, just a few months ago, retired from the reserves and no longer fly for the military, which makes me sad. But in 2010, uh, I was part of the big class of 2010 Republicans to come in and, and take the House and uh, was elected and served for 12 years, six terms, which is quite a while. And, you know, obviously with all the January 6th stuff, it, that became a little bit of what I was known for, or I guess a big part of what I was known for. But my interest was always America's role in the world, the role in NATO and foreign policy, because I think we play a a very important role. So, you know, it's nice to kind of get back to those roots of, of foreign policy and talking about Ukraine. And that's how my career has gone so far at the ripe old age of almost 46. Adam, would you give us your take then, your sense of the current state of the Republican Party looking towards the presidential election in November? Are you optimistic or pessimistic when it comes to the uh, potential election and certainly the potential candidature of Donald Trump? Well, look, I think, first off, 
there's maybe about six people in total in the United States that want to see a Biden and Trump rematch. And they're all Biden, Trump, and uh, a couple of their family members. The rest of us are just sitting here shaking our heads saying, how are we back in this position? Particularly on my end, how are we here facing Donald Trump again? After January 6th and January 7th, if you'd have come and told me, hey, Adam, guess what? Trump's going to run again. I wouldn't have believed you if you much less told me he'd be the nominee. I think you were like losing your mind. So you know, it's it's this instability. It's the thing I'm trying to grapple with on this side is we have this political instability. We have this kind of deep consternation, this feeling that everything is not right in the population when actually the numbers say otherwise. You know, we have an economy that's doing actually pretty well. It's recovering. We're seeing inflation rates come down. But I think what's happened is it's not really the economy anymore. It's not even really foreign policy. Foreign policy has a role in, for instance, in Trump and Biden, just in kind of a general overall sense. And I can get more into that. But there's this kind of culture war that has seeped not just into American politics. I think you see it, you're just talking about Germany. You see that a little in Germany. You see it all over the world where it's become this hate for somebody that thinks differently. So where do I see the Republican Party right now I think if Joe Biden had been anti-Ukraine, the Republican Party would be pro-Ukraine. But since Joe Biden is pro-Ukraine, this is the insanity of it, since he's pro-Ukraine, you're seeing people use Ukraine against him because the biggest thing becomes, how do we win? I'll just say quickly, in 2015, I remember, so I was elected in 2010. 2015, I was on the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and I would get into an argument all the time with a fellow Republican out of uh, out of California. His name's Dana Rohrbacher. I mean, to the point that we actually thought that Dana was paid by the FSB, and we were serious about that. And I would have people that would tell me, like, Adam, don't worry about Dana. He's like, he's a strange duck. Obviously, the GOP is pro, is anti-Russia. Well, look, we're just, what, six, seven years later. And, uh, and it seems like I would break the Republican Party down as a quarter strongly support Ukraine, a quarter strongly oppose helping Ukraine, and 50% have no clue or are waiting to be told what to feel. So that's the moment. It's a, it's a huge opportunity for leadership that seems to, unfortunately, with the exception of Nikki Haley, be lacking in the GOP. Adam, thank you so much for talking us through that. Can I ask, in your conversations with voters, what do you hear about their views and how much of what you've just said filters down to people who, in the end, uh, end up end up voting Republican? Yeah, I mean, I hear, I would say from my conversations, I've been traveling the country a lot. I'm just getting off of a book tour and a speaking tour. I mean, it is very rare. I'll see divisions when I talk about things like Gaza. Obviously, I'm very pro-Israel in that. But, you know, and you'll see divisions in the crowd when you talk about that. When I talk about Ukraine, it is 95% to 100% of the audience is like, yes, Ukraine has to defend itself. I talk about, for instance, the fact that in Ukraine, I mean, here we're sitting there tearing ourselves apart in the United States and other countries Whereas in Ukraine, you have people that think very different politically that are willing to put their lives on the line in the trenches of Ukraine. And when you talk about that, people react, I think, very well. Where my concern is, is I don't see that kind of political leadership quite on. Let's be honest, from Joe Biden, especially from Donald Trump, you don't see it, of course. But I've been critical in saying I think Joe Biden needs to be making more speeches on behalf of Ukraine. I mean, look. The idea that the American people will lead politicians where we should go on foreign policy, that's just unrealistic. I mean, throughout history, politicians, it's called a leadership position for a reason. You have to lead. Politicians have been the ones to lay out a path, lay out a vision, and actually get the country, in essence, girded for war, even if we don't have to fight in it, to produce for the war. And there's been a lot of silence. So I, I would I would say that Joe Biden needs to come out and speak quite a bit more, not to convince Democrats. I think Democrats are certainly on the side of Ukraine, but to be able to paint the vision for what we're doing. One of the most misunderstood things is what is USAID? USAID is actually money spent in essence to create better weapons for the United States and give our old stuff to Ukraine. And it's, it's spent here in the United States. That's the kind of information that needs to get out. Are you going to convince you know, 90% of the Republicans when you're Joe Biden? No. Are you going to convince some? Yes. Are you going to put a narrative out there for people to grab hold of and leave this country? Yes, I think so. And uh, 
That would be my criticism. I don't know if Donald Trump is savable in this, to be honest with you. And I think we have a very limited window in Congress to get aid done. I'm not hopeless, but I'm starting to get a little more pessimistic on that. Can I ask, in your experience, Adam, what are the arguments that work either on your colleagues in Congress or with voters? What, what have you found in terms of when you're making the case for the US to support Ukraine? What are, what are, the, what are the things, the points you make that actually land? Well, look, when, when it comes to my colleagues, all you, I mean, you don't even have to make the case. They all know it. They're just scared to say it publicly because for some reason this has become, and not, not all of them again, there are some that do, but let's just look at the Republican Party for now. You know, Mike McCall, who's a friend of mine, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, certainly pro-Ukraine, made a statement that way the other day, a little aggressive to Donald Trump, but hasn't said much more. Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, same thing. It's like, I've been trying to talk to these folks and say, look, this is a historic, as a guy that went through a historic moment on the January 6th committee, for instance, I can tell you it may cost you a little bit, but it's you, can, you certainly feel at peace. You can look at yourself in the mirror. And so for my colleagues, it's making the statement of like, Never, it's very rare in history for a member of Congress to be able to make an impact around the world. Yeah, you can be part of a team that changes policy and makes a difference. You can travel. I travel a lot, right? But if you're, let's say, if you're in the GOP right now and you just, you get a coalition of six of you that want to deny the Republican Party any bill to pass the floor until they promise to put Ukraine aid down for an up or down vote. You could literally change the world because I can tell you if you hold to the end of that, and this is the case I'm making to these folks, if you hold to the end of that, eventually the speaker will have to put the Ukraine aid on the floor to break the log jam for any other piece of legislation and it would pass. So I guess the point I make is, guys, like there's a moment to find courage and that moment is now. For the American people, I think it's pretty simple. I think, you know, Americans still get very emotionally invested in when you talk about the role we have in the world, the fact that the Iron Curtain came down, not necessarily because of American, British, German, French military, that was part of it, but largely because our ideas. The third generation of people behind the Iron Curtain saw enough of Western life that they wanted a piece of it, and they tore the Iron Curtain down. That is, Americans react very emotionally to that. We understand that we have a unique role in the world. And I think the other thing, quite honestly, is just to express to people, what is U.S. aid? You know, the fact that, look, we have an $800 billion a year military budget. Obviously, we have an incredible military that can do incredible things. If for just a 10% of the cost of that, we can defeat one of our main foes. And look, Russia has lost 500 men a day. We lost... They lose every five days what America lost in 20 years in Afghanistan, and we left. So the only thing that we can be defeated by, the Brits, the U.S., all of our friends, the only things we can be defeated by is if our will is defeated. And that, I think, usually, usually does well for the American people to hear it. And that's what leaders need to speak about, I think. Adam, so great to have you on the podcast, and thank you for listening to us for so long. I just want to pick up on something you said a moment ago about scepticism in a sense being able to win Trump round. Of course, there's been a lot of speculation from Ukrainians. We've discussed it on the podcast about this notion that who knows, maybe if Zelensky is able to charm Trump, he does suddenly become an advocate for their cause. But I suppose what I'm putting to you with the remarks that you've just made, is it too late, do you think? Or is there that powerful wing of Trump supporters who are actually so firmly anti-Ukrainian that the chances of him wanting to go against them is now it's too late and the chances of there being that sort of reversal that some are thinking is at least conceivable has slipped away. No, I don't think it's hopeless because look, Trump, and I know him, even though he and I are not friends (laughs) by any means is the best way to put it. We know each other quite well. And I sat in the Oval Office, in fact, and convinced him with, it was me, Liz Cheney, and a couple others, convinced him not to leave Syria back in 17 or 18. He's very influenceable. And he's potentially, you can influence him, or specifically, you can influence him when it would reflect on his reputation. So if, in fact, he wins, and by the way, I want to be clear, I think we need to take the risk of Trump winning very strongly. I'm a Republican and I will be supporting Joe Biden over Donald Trump. If that's not obvious, I want to make it clear here because democracy is at stake in my mind. But 
I don't think his victory, you know, I hear about out of da- Davos, everybody's already assuming Donald Trump's going to win. I, I think the chances are greater than not that he loses. I think we have to take this seriously, though. And so I think let's say he does win, though. Now, all of a sudden, if Ukraine is still defending itself, which it, it will be, and now it would be on Donald Trump's watch that Ukraine would potentially lose or have to surrender or have to give up a significant amount of territory. Now, all of a sudden, that reflects on Donald Trump himself. And that's unfortunately, I got to say, when you're a deep narcissist, that's how you appeal to a deep narcissist is what does this look like for you? And that's a, a point I make to my Democratic friends as well is, look, Joe Biden's quote unquote bubble pops, his approval rating was really high until we left Afghanistan. Now, it doesn't mean that America wanted to stay in Afghanistan. I I think we made a mistake leaving there. That's my personal opinion. But, you know, Americans, sure, they wanted out. They were tired of it, et cetera. It wasn't leading the headlines, by the way. But where it affected Joe Biden was not the policy to leave. It was the fact that it felt, and it was, very chaotic. And that violates who we are as Americans. I'm sure the British feel the same way and felt the same way during that withdrawal which is like, this isn't who we are. We're people that stick with. And so that affected, you notice after that chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, his approval rating dropped to the 40s and really never recovered. Ukraine can do the same to Joe Biden if he's not careful. This is why he needs to be making the case. And this is this is why, you know, that's very important. People may not vote on foreign policy, but it certainly adds to the background of how they feel overall about somebody's leadership potential, leadership skills. Thank you. And just a couple more quickly on this sort of theme. Sure. Very interested as well. It's, I'm going to put to you a question I put to our, another American guest we had on uh, uh, during this week. Is What is your sense of the Republican fraternity more broadly? I'm not really talking about the voters and I'm not talking about Trump and the le- and the presidential candidates and even Congress necessarily. I'm talking about the think tanks, the policy wonks, the groups that are really the ones that build and shape an administration's agenda. And of course, they're working very, very hard at the moment. I'm very interested in your perception of the shifts going on within that fold with regard to the war in Ukraine and with regard to Europe. And my second question is a corollary to that, which is, do you think it is actually conceivable that the U.S. would withdraw from NATO under Trump? Or do you think that that would be a step too far even for them and for Donald Trump? Well, on the NATO question, look, I I think Donald Trump would like to, in theory. And I don't necessarily know if he wants to leave NATO because he really has a personal issue with NATO. It's just when you think, again, when you think like a narcissist, and I don't even mean this to attack him. He's just, I think he's clinically a narcissist. So we got to think of it this way. It's all about him being able to do big things and him being able to put himself at the center of attention. And I think that's what NATO's about. It's I'm a, it's not we're America. Look, he's not doing this. Let's be clear. He's also not doing this on behalf of the American people. It's on behalf of himself. So he may express it. He may even attempt to leave NATO, but I don't think Congress or the Senate would let him. Look, there, there's, it, you know, as bad as the situation about supporting Ukraine is maybe here domestically, there's not there's not opposition to NATO membership. And I mean, look, NATO, quite honestly, has stepped up in the last few years, particularly. I mean, we see what they're doing in Ukraine. We see the increase of, of military spending. But what it can do is his words, even if we don't officially leave NATO and continue to participate. I mean, obviously, a president saying those words really damages an alliance and has the potential to destroy it. And, you know, especially if Vladimir Putin would win in Ukraine or at least freeze it to a, a stalemate and then make an attempt on Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania Would Donald Trump order troops. But I think what's become obvious as a quick aside is that even if the U.S. didn't get involved, I think Poland itself, the U.K., could crush Russia. Russia's getting just walked all over short of the nuclear weapon issue. On the larger think tank thing, Yeah, this is a big concern for me because there's still a very good conservative think tank, American Enterprise Institute. I'm a fan of theirs. They think conservative policy for, you know, they're kind of the last of the Mohicans, if you will, on true conservative thought. You look at like Heritage Foundation, this really what used to be a bulwark of deep conservative thought really has become just a fundraising mechanism. And and creating stuff that is just like out of control so they can go and raise money on it and have more people show up to stuff. Yeah, that think tank group, like 
One of the things we learned as politicians is you can raise money really well on fear. One of the things we didn't learn as politicians that we should have is you can use fear sparingly, but then you have to sandwich it with optimism and vision. Otherwise, the whole country turns dark because people follow leadership. And unfortunately, since we haven't pivoted to an optimistic vision and we just continue to peddle in fear, the think tanks follow suit because that's how they make money as well. Look, I, I think I'll say this. Either the Republican Party has to lose again in November and keep losing. So it has to basically burn to save itself. And I say this again as a Republican. I call myself a Republican still because I refuse to give up. But at the same time, I'm not voting Republican at the moment. They have to continue to lose or there's going to be a conservative movement that rises up in its stead. And it, it, we can call it the Fluorism movement. I don't care. You can make up any name you want, whatever you guys, you guys have weird parties in the UK. So we'll call it that. We'll call it liberal, even though it's not, you know, whatever. But, you know, we can make up a name for it, but there's always got to be a quote unquote liberal, a left movement and a right movement. And right now the right movement in this country has become ultra nationalist and it's a very sick movement. Another question, slightly unrelated actually to the subject we were talking about a moment ago, Adam, and thank you for your answer. I think that's really interesting on these think tanks. And I know it, it does sound a bit, I'm no doubt, boring for some listeners who don't really care about think tanks. God knows I have to deal with a lot of think tanks here in Britain and it's not the most exciting world, but it's ma it matters. And that's why I mention it. It's hugely important as you've articulated so well. But I, I wanted to change subjects slightly, Adam, and talk about the media. Of course, you're now a political to commentator for CNN. Uh, What's your perception of the media landscape in the United States on foreign policy, on Europe, on Ukraine and more broadly? Looking at it from an outsider's perspective, it seems a very different world than the one that we know here in Britain and in Europe. Not necessarily saying that in a critical way, but it is very different. So your reflections are very welcome on that. And also as well, just interested in your perception generally about the direction of travel of media in the United States with the sort of resurgence of Trump and that sort of populism. Do you, are you an optimist or a pessimist with regards to the media landscape? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I, I guess in a way I'm a little pessimistic. I mean, there's a lot of people will say the more media sources, the better. I understand that point of view. The de less centralized the media, the better. I understand that point of view. And probably 10 years ago, I'd have told you, yes, that's great, because that brings it's like the democratization of the media. The problem is, is it's not really the de democratization of the media it just creates a lot of extremism and competition. I honestly, the, I think the UK, at least as much as I've watched you guys do media well. I mean, there's a freedom of the press. There also seems to be a responsibility to tell the truth and have a spin on it. But it's not just outright lies. Malcolm Turnbull, the former prime minister of Australia, has become a friend of mine, and I've talked with him about the difference between media in Australia versus the United States and kind of the things that can keep the media in line better. And I think really the only thing in the United States that can is lawsuits, like you've seen these lawsuits against Fox News, for instance, and on the claims the election were stolen. We don't want to go down the slippery slope of everybody gets sued every time they say anything, but we also need to have some guardrails in there. So... I mean, I'm a little pessimistic, except that each new generation, when it inherits like a new technology, if you will, struggles with how to deal with that. And then it's further generations that learn how to manage and control it. So you think about Coca-Cola, for instance, when that when the first time Coca-Cola came out, I mean, people were drinking two cases of this stuff a day. Now somebody may drink one or two or even none of it because you've learned how to manage that. My hope is, my plea, I guess, is that Americans, in our case, instead of saying we're going to believe everything presented to us, it's now, okay, we're going to take a cornucopia of things presented to us and we're going to make our own educated pick. Now, that would be my optimistic view. The problem is we've gotten to this moment here where people just turn to the media that makes them feel good and they don't care if it's true or not. Rupert Murdoch and Fox News is a great example of just, you know, spoon feeding people garbage and uh, convincing them of utter lies. So there are still great, I, I think CNN, for instance, is still, I'm not just saying it because they employ me. I, I truly believe they're a, a great news organization. There are some out there. The question is, will people watch it? I got a little disturbed. I think it was in Iowa. I'm sitting there on the desk. We're talking about what's going on in Iowa, like it mattered, didn't. But 
And I just remember thinking, we're talking about Donald Trump now as a normal candidate. We're talking about his campaign and what his people are doing. And it's like, this is a guy that tried to overthrow the U.S. government. And so where I worry about where the media is going is, do they have to now talk about Donald Trump as a normal candidate? when he's the nominee. I don't have a good answer for that. You guys as media folks may be able to answer that better. I guess the best thing you can do is just continue to call out lies when he tells them. But it's a weird thing for me to sit there and talk about this absolute traitor to America as if he's a normal man running for president. Because in my mind, he deserves to be behind bars and very well maybe. I think the technology might be too much. I don't think, Adam, you're hearing James, are you? No, I didn't get it. Okay. Well, Thank you, James, for the question. This is what James wants to ask. He says, German politicians tell me they, and wider Europe, will need to focus more on self-reliance in terms of defence if Trump wins, that they can't rely on the Americans. What are your thoughts on that? Well, look, I mean, I think it's... Gosh, I wish I could say no. You can always rely on the Americans. That would make me feel better to say. I think it's always important, first off, just for Europe, to not need the United States anyway. Because, you know, if you can defend yourself... That's a good thing. I mean, obviously, we we have a special ability. We have an amazing military. I served in it for 22 years. I'm proud of it. And I do think we'll always be there for our friends in Europe. But that said, what's the insurance policy? Just be able to fight the wars as well, the best you can yourself. I think, look, if Donald Trump, let's say he wins, and again, I still put the, the chances of that as much smaller, but let's say he wins. It's not like over that four years, we're going to become aligned with Russia and we're going to create Russia, US, NATO. Like That's not going to happen. It's going to be a crazy time like the last four years. And then we're going to correct. Look, I, look. here's my optimism. 2028 is actually going to be an amazing year in America. And I'm truly optimistic that the new American century is coming because it's going to be two parties with all new candidates, all new blood, all new generation, all new ideas. We need that at this moment. So I don't think we're going away. But yeah, I think it's important for Europe to be able to defend itself, to be able to continue to grow. But if it's this idea like this, look, I, you know, I've traveled the world in my 12 years in Congress. And it's not just now. Every time, I mean, even under Obama, we'd go travel somewhere and it's like, is the U.S. abandoning us? And it's like, no. Obama really screwed up in Syria, hugely, by the way. And everybody was thinking that America was pulling out of the world. We didn't. This is what happens every year. And some of you that have been around a while know this. It's always a question. But defend yourself too. And I think we'll be here to help. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Adam. We'll come back to you uh, to hear your final thoughts. But let's go first to Berlin with our Berlin correspondent, James Rothwell. Adam, I'm very sorry. You may not be able to hear this, but we can hear you, James. I I think this is just been such a, an interesting discussion and I, I was particularly interested by what Adam said just a moment ago sort of expressing the wish that if only if everyone could feel uh, that they could rely on um, for America in terms of security and I think that really speaks to the anxiety that the Germans have got they've harbored um, for some time now since the invasion of Ukraine a desire uh, to sort of progress on a sort of self-sufficient, self-reliant mode of European defence. And perhaps from their perspective, because as German politicians in the main are not overly keen on Trump, they may see his potential victory later this year as an opportunity to put some rockets under that policy. Now, what exactly the Germans mean when they say being completely self-deficient on defence, that's less clear. If we're going to stretch out that theory, does it mean something as stark as the Europeans fighting a war with Russia without US support? Probably not. But could it mean that they would be more proactive in terms of tackling potential threats from Russia, particularly on the eastern flank, where we've seen threats from Putin towards countries like Estonia? perhaps they do. So I think that's my sort of main takeaway from this. And as I said before, I I recommend to our listeners just keeping an eye on German politics over the next few months, because it could have a bit of an impact on the war in Ukraine, to put it mildly, in the near future. Well, thank you so much for that, James. Apologies, Adam. You might have to listen to James's final thought on the podcast later. Francis Sternley, can we go to you next? 
Well, thanks, David. Yesterday, I looked at a fringe story about cats and what it revealed about the information war between Russia and Ukraine. And today I want to look at a different subject, but in a similar way. Provincial museums in Russia and what they tell us about how the Russian state is already manufacturing a history of this war. All credit to Natalia Vasilyeva, of course, our former Russian and now Middle Eastern correspondent. It's a story on the website Media Zona about how provincial museums in Russia are putting on display loot from Ukraine, I think that's the only way you can describe it, and personal belongings of Russian troops. The exhibits include everything from boxers, pants, underwear, uh, (laughs) saying all the terms that would be relevant to our listeners, helmets inscribed with Pushkin's signature, everything you can conceivably imagine that a soldier may have on their person. And for context, in this article, it relays how in April 2023, and I remember we reported on it at the time, Putin had ordered the creation of museums related to the war in Ukraine, as well as to search for and transfer to museums workers' artefacts related to that conflict. And to do this, under the auditors of the Russian Historical Society, he created this intermuseum group in the Ministry of Culture and began this search for exhibits. And this is all the result of that. And these exhibits are shown in large travelling exhibitions with titles like Ordinary Nazism about Ukraine or To the Testaments of Faith. They include, as a hundreds of personal objects and trophies uh, appearing from Ukrainian armed forces chevrons, fragments of Ukrainian shells, commemorative coins, historical documents. As they report in the article, some of the exhibitions are organised according to the guidelines of the federal authorities, which are designed to unify how these are presented to the different populations where these are travelling around these exhibits. Thousands were just taken from Herzon during the occupation and are now stored in Russia. They appear to be lying in Crimea. They've not been catalogued because there aren't any computers to do so. But you can see that basically as territory has been taken, they've then taken objects both from their own soldiers and from Ukraine in the form of trophies and have then transferred them to Russia and elsewhere in the hope of essentially promoting this war as not only one that is being fought, but is part of this broader narrative. And in that vein, an interesting snippet in the article is an exhibit called From the Heroes of Bygone Times. And it dedicates to the natives of Udmurtia who participated in the wars from 1812 all the way down to the invasion of Ukraine. And as I say, it plays into this kind of story of the war in Ukraine being relevant to other great campaigns in Russia's past. We all know the significance of that date, 1812, as the defeat of Napoleon. It's a subject I did a Defence in Depth video on for the paper a few months ago, making comparisons with the conflict in Ukraine. There's more than you might think, and if you're interested in that, we'll put a link in it to the show notes of this episode, along with other things we've referenced today. And it would be remiss of me uh, not to just thank all of the listeners who have flooded my social media and our inbox with cat photos after yesterday's final thought. Uh, For those wondering, I plan to name my future cat Fezziwig. But there were some great guesses from you, like Pickwick and things like that. But yes, Fezziwig. But thanks very much, David. And thanks again, Adam, for your thoughts today. Really, really fascinating hearing your perspective. Well, thank you, James and Francis. Adam, as our guest, would you like the very final words? Well, from the country that gave us Bodie McBoatface, I would expect pretty solid uh, cat names. But look, I uh, again, I enjoyed being here. The things I'm going to be looking for in this next kind of week or two to figure out, particularly with Ukraine, is I'm going to be watching Mitch McConnell. So look, this is a guy that is one of the shrewdest politicians, good and bad, out there. You look at, uh, I mean, just, I think... Look, he's very pro-Ukraine, and I think he feels a lot of guilt right now for that this should have gone in the fall, but they thought they could get it done later and play some little cutesy games with it. Obviously, he voted against the removal of Donald Trump from office after January 6th, and he could have changed that whole thing and basically had him banned from running again. So I think he's dead set on getting Ukraine done. If there is a way, certainly the will is there with McConnell. So I'm going to be watching him, and I'm going to be watching to see some of these quiet members. So I have a subset now, and I wrote about this, the number of Republicans that have sat on the sideline kind of silent. Do they finally speak up or don't they? Because again, they're going to have 
a number of they're pro Ukraine. Are they going to actually speak out now? I think that's what we'll see over the next week or two. And uh, Slava Ukraine. Hopefully this works out and we never look back with regrets of, of this moment. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.